want to welcome you here today. Now, today is Good Friday, and I have always struggled with that language as a child. It's hard to see the torture and the death and the pain of Jesus as good. I think there's a difficulty maybe that we all feel inside when we look at the cross and we call it good. There's difficulty when we ponder the blood of Christ, the death of Christ, and thinking of those things is good. I can't think of any other circumstance in culture uh, where people would look at things like the cross and the blood and call it good, except when we talk about Jesus. Uh, there are times where we may have relief at the death of a terrorist or uh, some kind of solace in knowing that justice has been served, but even then we don't glory in that. Now, there are some scholars and there are people who would uh, come from Christian traditions that have tried to separate our faith from the cross because they don't like the violence. Even this morning I was reading a, a post from a theologian who talked about why they don't like the cross. They don't like the violence. They don't like the death. They don't like the concept of Christ on the cross. Yet, if we separate the cross from our faith, then really we have abandoned our faith. Calling today good is an essential part of our faith. And apart from the goodness of Friday, the miracle of Sunday has very little meaning. And so we find joy in what today is all about. So much so that we sing songs about the old rugged cross. We sing songs about blood that flows from Emmanuel's veins and being plunged beneath the blood. As strange as these things may sound, we do this because the cross and blood are central not to just our belief system. They aren't totems or superstitions that we hope will help us. The blood of Jesus and the blood of His sacrifice is what has made a way for us to be right with God. His sacrifice on the cross brings redemption for our sins. That's why it is good. And so today as we gather together, we're going to look deeper at the question of why the cross, why the blood, what makes these things good. And as we do that, we don't want to separate these questions from our everyday lives. We want to see Jesus' sacrifice as important for us today. Where we stand, where we live, where we are. This is a good day. The cross is good because ultimately our God is good. Will you pray with me? Father, we gather here today, some out of tradition. Some of us are drawn here because we feel as though it's something we need to be a part of. Will you remind us again of the goodness of Friday? Will you remind us again of the wonder of your sacrifice and the joy that we find as believers in being able to look to the cross and see not, uh, not just torture, not death, not, not, not blood, but to see sacrifice, to see salvation, and to see love. Help us to remember that as we gather here today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We declare the love that Christ demonstrated for us as we sing, Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Would you please stand and sing with us?
the reasons that Jesus died, one of the reasons that Friday can be considered good is because in his death, he deals with the wrath of God. Uh, I, I, even looking at this this morning, I, I was wondering about the language that we chose for this, this wording here, to turn away God's wrath. There's certainly an element of that that's true, but even more so, it's not as though it's, it's deflected. It's not as though it's ignored. It's dealt with. And one of the reasons that people want to abandon Good Friday, one of the reasons they want to abandon the cross, is because of this idea of God's wrath. But yet, when we read Scripture, we cannot escape the idea of God's wrath. We certainly don't like to dwell on it. This certainly isn't the picture necessarily of God that we want to em embrace on a daily basis. Yet, it's so true in Scripture. We see His wrath against humanity when Noah and his family are spared while the rest of the world drowns. We see God's wrath poured out on Sodom and Gomorrah for their sinfulness. We see his wrath against the Egyptians as they're caught in the rushing waters of the Red Sea. We see God's wrath as we read through the book of, books of the law and realize the seriousness of sin. And we see his wrath when the Israelites march through the promised land, devoting whole cities to destruction. We see God's wrath when later the Jews are defeated and carried away into captivity because they failed to stay true to the Lord. These are pictures of God's wrath that speak to the greater wrath that God will pour out on sin. And we struggle with this thought, yet, yet it is an appropriate and expected action of a holy and righteous God. That when presented with evil, evil will be punished. God will pour out His wrath. Isaiah 26 tells us that the Lord is coming out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. Nahum 12 says that the Lord is full of wrath. Romans 1 tells us that the wrath of God is being revealed against the ungodly. Ezekiel 25 tells us that God will execute vengeful rebukes. God's wrath is real, but his wrath is not arbitrary like someone flying off the handle. It's measured and it is directed against sin. In his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, Jonathan Edwards gave some stirring language to really develop this concept of God's wrath as it can be directed against us. This is what he says. The bow of God's wrath is bent. The arrow made ready on the string. And justice bends the arrow at your heart and strains the bow. And it is nothing but the mere pleasure of God and that of an angry God without any promise or obligation at all that keeps the arrow one moment from being made drunk with your blood. The wrath is directed towards us, yet God sends His Son to bear that wrath in our place. We stand condemned and deserving of that wrath because each of us are sinful. No matter how hard we try, we can't live a perfect life. No matter how many times we, we give effort to doing what is right, we will inevitably do something wrong. Oftentimes, when presented with the choice of honoring ourselves or others, we choose the selfish choice. So we stand condemned. God in His holiness is unable to relate with beings that are sinful, and so His appropriate and expected action is to punish. But yet we also know He is merciful and He is patient. So we are not punished immediately in an ultimate sense. We have this life. We've been given this time on this earth. But there will be punishment for sin. And God's wrath must be poured out on someone for the sins of our hearts. This is one of the reasons that Jesus dies. This is one of the reasons that the cross is good. Because he dies to deal with God's wrath. 1 John 2.2 says he is the propitiation for our sins. He is Jesus. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus is the propitiation. This is a big theological word. That means his life is a sacrifice. His life appeases the wrath of God. It is in our place. And when Jesus dies on the cross, he willingly lays down his life as a sacrifice for us. This is the only sacrifice that would be acceptable to pay for our sins and to deal with God's wrath. When Jesus dies, he is taking that wrath meant for us and he is bearing it on his behalf, on our behalf, so that we can live. And that's why we can call today a good day. Because we are reminded of what Jesus did on the cross in dealing with God's wrath. In a moment, we're going to stand together and we're going to sing songs, sing a medley of songs 
that focus on the blood of Jesus. And we don't sing this out of some sort of sick fascination with death. We sing and celebrate because there is power in the blood. And there is power to deal with God's wrath. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we are thankful that in your death you dealt with the wrath of God. That because you died and because you bore the weight of sin upon yourself, we will not have to bear that weight. We are thankful for that. We are grateful for that. And as we worship together, may our hearts uh, be turned towards that idea that you have dealt with God's wrath. And may we rejoice in that. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. stand and sing with us these familiar hymns that were given to the church.
be seated. Jesus dies to deal with God's wrath. He also dies to demonstrate God's justice. And God's wrath is just. It's not like an angry dictator flying off the handle. It's measured and it's appropriate and it is just. And in that, we see justice in action. Sin will be punished. A lot of times we take comfort in this when terrorists attack or when we read about genocidal maniacs like Hitler, we clamor for justice. We want to see justice served. Yet, how often do we want justice for the sin in our life? From the fall of mankind in Genesis 3, God made it clear that sin requires punishment. Sin requires a payment. God covers Adam and Eve in animal skins that He provides, making it clear to Adam and Eve that something will have to give of its life in order to cover sin. The sacrificial system of the Old Testament puts this on display. Animals give of their life so that sin may be covered for a time, pointing to the greater sacrifice that would come. So when Jesus dies on the cross, His death demonstrates God's absolute commitment to justice. Many of us go through life thinking of God as a benevolent grandparent or a merciful teacher. We think that He'll just look away when we make those minor mistakes. We want to believe that we can just squeak by, that we'll get by on the bell curve, as Pastor Matt likes to say. But there's no justice in that. God's justice means that everything will be dealt with. And it is dealt with in one of two ways. First, we can pay for our own sin. In reality, we cannot. Uh, But we can spend all of eternity in hell attempting to do so. And that would be just that we're being punished for what we've done. But the other option, the option that makes this day good, is that Jesus can pay for our sins. God can pour out His wrath on His Son, thus ensuring that sin is paid for. See, there has to be a payment. One that we cannot make. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Edmund betrays his brothers and sisters. And according to the deep magic that holds Narnia together, every traitor belongs to the witch as her lawful prey. And for every treachery, she has a right to kill, even though the offense is not ultimately against her. In the book that Lewis writes, there's an element of justice at work. Payment must be made for this transgression. And Aslan, the the lion who represents Christ, knows this. And so he willingly lays his life down for that of Edmund. He gives his life as a payment for the betrayal. He offers his own blood in exchange for the blood of Edmund. He knows and understands that a payment must be made, and he pays it. He goes willingly to pay it. Justice demands a sacrifice, and Aslan makes that payment. Romans 3.22 helps us to understand this a little better. For there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I love that. There is no distinction. It reminds us that rich or poor, it reminds us that no matter if we were born into the church or we found Christ later in life, no matter where we've come from, no matter what we have, there is no distinction. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. Jesus' sacrifice, His blood brings propitiation. His blood brings justice. His blood serves justice. Nothing is forgotten, no sin is ignored, nothing is uh, swept underneath the rug. It's all dealt with. And in a moment, the singers are going to perform a song entitled, It Took a Lamb. And one of the lyrics says this, that one day the rule of justice was accomplished by a touch from mercy's hand. As the Father in compassion said, it's time to send the spotless lamb. Justice is appeased as the lamb who is Jesus, is sacrificed for our sin. And so in that, in seeing justice demonstrated, this is why, this is why the cross is good. This is why we can call today good. Father, we are thankful for your justice. 
And we are thankful that your justice was served as Christ bore the weight of sin on the cross. We're thankful that you are not a God who abandons what you have said to be true, that you will hold all things accountable, that you are holding all things accountable. And Father, we glory in your mercy that has made a way for us despite the weight of sin that we would bear. To see it put on Christ and to see justice served is, is a gracious thing, is a wonderful thing, is something that we do not deserve, yet we are thankful for. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Not only does Jesus' death turn away God's wrath, not only does it demonstrate His justice, but it also justifies us freely by God's grace. Justice and justify are connected closely, not just in word. When justice is served, then we can be justified. When we're justified, we're declared righteous because Christ has assumed the debt of our sinfulness. And now we no longer appear as sinful, but instead we appear as righteous before God because our hope and our trust and our faith is tied up in what Christ has done on the cross. Now we are justified. When I was a child, I learned that, learned it to say now it is just as if we had never sinned. In Zechariah 3, the prophet Zechariah recounts a vision that he has had. And in this vision, the high priest is pictured. The high priest has filthy garments, which is a picture of sin and iniquity. And God instructs others to remove the filthy garments from the high priest and instead to clothe him in pure vestments. The passage says, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And this is a picture of justification. That we're no longer stained with sin. We're now seen as pure. We're now seen as clean. And the reason that we are seen that way is because Jesus' death cleanses us. Romans 4, 24 and 25 says, It will be counted to us who believe in Him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. He was delivered for our trespasses. He suffered for that. And in His resurrection, we see our justification proved. He has dealt with sin. And His death makes a way for us. In just a moment, the singers will come and sing again a pair of songs reminding us of the power of the cross and reminding us that that is what we boast in. We boast in what Jesus did on the cross. Your standing religiously is not due to however many Bible verses that you have learned. It's not a result of being in church every Sunday for the past however many years. It's not a result of what you have done. It's a result of the death of Christ and the righteousness that He gives us and the justification that we enjoy. And so when we're looking for a reason to explain why we are justified, we point to the cross. My sins have been taken care of because of what Jesus did on the cross. My penalty was paid by Christ on the cross. We look to His suffering, to His pain, to His death, and ultimately to His resurrection for proof that we have been justified. So as they prepare to sing songs about these important truths, will you meditate and will you focus on the words that are on the screen? Thank God for His provision. Thank Jesus for His sacrifice. Jesus, we are thankful for Your sacrifice. We're thankful that in doing so, You deal with sin. In doing so, You justify us so that we can live with Your righteousness. So that we can stand under the weight of sin that You have dealt with. And so that we can proclaim Your glory in that. Lord, may we never boast about what we've done, but may we always glory in what you did on the cross. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
Jesus' death leads into his resurrection. This is a good day only because Sunday is coming. And on Sunday, we will celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, the day in which death is defeated. And that resurrection proves something. It proves that his sacrifice was sufficient. It proves that God's wrath has been dealt with. It proves that God's justice is satisfied. And it is what we rely on when we look to our own justification. We stand with Christ's righteousness rather than our sinfulness. And this justification comes through God's grace because, again, it is not what we have done that makes us right with God, but what Christ has done. Herein lies the difference between religion and Christian faith. Religions say do. And you may have grown up in a tradition where it was about what you have done. Christianity is something different. Christian belief, the gospel, does not say do. It says done. What Jesus has done is what justifies us. And by God's grace, that can be credited to us. So that when we are asked, why, why would you spend eternity in heaven? Our answer is never, because I did anything. But it's always and only because Jesus died for us. Why is Good Friday good? It is good because we remember Jesus' sacrifice. It's good because we remember what that sacrifice does. And it's good because we understand that that sacrifice is not just meant for us. It is not just meant for those inside of these walls. That sacrifice is for your neighbor. That sacrifice is for your loved one. That sacrifice is for your family member. That sacrifice is for your coworker. For your friend. It is for the person in a village, in a, in a land that you have never heard of. It is for so many people. And we have been called to take the message of Good Friday and to take the message of Resurrection Sunday and to proclaim that with a joy. It is good because of what it means to us, what it means for us, and what it means for them. And we want others to understand what we understand. That Good Friday is good because Jesus lays his life down for us, making a way for us to be made right with God. And that we celebrate Sunday with great ex expectation, with great anticipation. We look forward to Sunday. And on Sunday when we gather with great joy, it is because Jesus' death was not the end. The resurrection tells us that Jesus' death was only the beginning. And so I invite you to stand with me as we close in prayer this morning. And when we leave here today, remember that this is a good day. Will you stand? Jesus, how can we even begin to express the gratitude, the love, the praise that we feel in response for what you have done for us on the cross? Lord, every, every response that we would give, any song that we would sing, any words that we would say would be woefully insufficient. You've taken God's wrath upon yourself. You've demonstrated God's justice. You've guaranteed our justification for these things and for so much more. We say thank you. And so like everything else we offer you, we ask that you would take our praise and purify it, magnify it, cause it to be a sweet aroma. Because you exhausted God's judgment against our foul sin, we now live by the gift of your perfect righteousness. So as we leave here today, we say amen. We say amen to your sacrifice. We say thank you for laying your life down for us. We offer this in, in your name. Amen.